This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news. At 8 o'clock this morning, His Majesty the King agreed to surrender to Germany. In return, no more British cities will be attacked with atomic bombs. Fear that Hitler might have a nuclear weapon terrified British and American leaders. After all, Germany was the greatest scientific nation in the world. It had discovered nuclear science. So why didn't it happen? After 1945, a remarkable explanation emerged. The German nuclear scientists had sabotaged their own bomb. As one of them said, History will record that the peaceful development of uranium was made in Germany under Hitler, whereas the English and the Americans developed this ghastly weapon of war. Can this really be true? Did Nazi scientists actually have more moral courage than those in America and Britain? At the end of World War II, an American task force called the Alsace Mission advanced with Allied troops into Germany. They were hunting for Germany's secret nuclear bomb factory. Its leader was the American physicist Samuel Goudsmit. The trail ended here, Heigerloch, a picturesque village in southern Germany. Heigerloch's church sat on top of a cliff. Beneath it, the soldiers found Germany's secret laboratory. The Allies had spent $2 billion, employed 180,000 people, and worked night and day for two years, all because of what they feared they might find here. And this was it, a cave the size of a wine cellar, a pathetic attempt at a nuclear reactor that no one had ever got to work. And even if they had, it would have been impossible to have built a bomb with it. It was an enormous surprise to discover that this was as far as the German project had gotten. It was the motivating reason behind the entire Allied effort. It was the reason that the Los Alamos physicists worked seven days a week, worked all late hours into the night, the fear that the Germans might any day, any hour, find some way to do it even more efficiently than the Americans and surprise the West with an atomic bomb. What had gone wrong? It's one of the great mysteries of World War II. Germany led the world in science, and in Heisenberg had the outstanding physicist of his generation. He knew more about the atom than any other scientist. If anyone could build a bomb, it would be him. Heisenberg had already turned science on its head. In 1925, suffering from a bad bout of hay fever, he had been sent to the barren island of Helgoland in the North Sea to recover. Whilst there, he had made the calculation that had changed the world. Er hat immer wieder gesagt, dass es ein sehr schöner Moment war. Und von He always said it had been a very beautiful moment. He told me that the idea had come to him during the night and that he went outside and climbed up a cliff to see the sunrise. I suppose nowadays we would say he was high from this revelation. With all the confidence of youth, Heisenberg brushed aside 300 years of physics and pioneered an entirely new way of thinking, quantum mechanics. He was 24 years old. By any count, Heisenberg has got to be one of the greatest physicists of all time. Because I think that the break 
between what had gone before and the Heisenberg conception of quantum mechanics was one of the greatest ever in the history of science. But the complexities of this young man made it doubtful whether he would ever fit in with the new masters of Germany. Werner Heisenberg had been born in 1901 in Bavaria. Wealth and privilege came easily to the Heisenbergs. Coming second did not. He's extremely competitive with his brother, we know. He and his brother were violently competitive and he just couldn't stand the offence to his intellectual dignity um, if he didn't have it right. Bavaria and Beethoven were part of a romantic dream of Germany that propelled the young Heisenberg into the youth movement and Lederhosen. Diese Jugendbewegung war eine sehr revolutionäre Bewegung. This youth movement was really a revolutionary one. They refused to wear their suits and put on leather shorts instead. This was not considered respectable at the time. And they would go skinny dipping and spend the nights playing music and singing around the campfires. None of this was respectable middle class behavior, but it was very romantic and it was extremely important to him. Heisenberg's university professors soon realized that they had found an extraordinary talent. This young man was a phenomenon and immediately everybody knew that they had on their hands somebody who was going to make the new physics. The 1920s was the golden age of physics. The science was young, international and open. Physicists were one big family, in each other's homes and universities, crisscrossing Europe, corresponding and collaborating, meeting and arguing. It was a wonderful time, and I came into physics just at the right time in 1926. Heisenberg had done quantum mechanics, and now we saw the world open to explain all phenomena which had been discovered for the last 50 years. Nothing captured the spirit of the time better than the annual gathering of young physicists in Copenhagen. Presiding over them was Niels Bohr, the father figure of world physics. Heisenberg was the crown prince. For two years, he worked in Copenhagen as Bohr's assistant and surrogate son. But Germany was the center the imperial capital of culture and science, where every ambitious student in the world hoped to go. German was the international language of science, and Heisenberg represented all the values of this pre-Nazi Germany, civilized, intelligent, morally upright. He was one of the best models of good German. He himself said, I embrace the Prussian virtues, which are modesty in living, uh, being reliable, uh, being punctual, all the good things. And um, he regarded himself as a Kulturträger, that is a carrier of culture. Heisenberg lived for culture and science, but politics disgusted him. He always said that he wanted to be free of the ties and injustices of politics, and this was one of the reasons why he chose physics and science. He hoped that he would be able to carry out research without having to get involved in lies and dirty diplomatic dealings. Mm. 
Heisenberg returned from Copenhagen to Germany in 1928 to become its youngest professor, home to a country and a university in turmoil. In the late 20s, the Nazis were getting stronger all the time, and there were demonstrations in Göttingen as elsewhere. Many of the students became Nazis and joined the party and so on. The professoriate was divided. Some became out-and-out -out Nazis. In 1933, Hitler took power and proclaimed a Reich that would last a thousand years. Heisenberg, meanwhile, was making his own journey to Stockholm to receive the Nobel Prize for Physics, little realizing that Hitler was about to take control of German science for his own ends. Among the books burned by Nazis in front of the University Library in Berlin in 1933 was Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, because the author was Jewish. The book burning symbolized the beginning of Germany's scientific isolation. In 1933, Hans Bethe, also a Jew, was teaching at the University of Tübingen. He was about to lecture on an important new discovery by the English scientist James Chadwick. Many students appeared in my lectures with a Nazi emblem. At that time, Chadwick discovered the neutron, and I uh, volunteered to give a lecture in the physics department uh, about this most important discovery. Then I was told that the students would uh, make trouble if I did that. And I was told to cancel that lecture. It was their loss. The most scientifically advanced nation in the world had been taken over by a gang of thugs. One of the first laws of the Nazis was the so-called law for the restoration of the professional civil service. All government employees with one or more Jewish relative had to be sacked. Teachers, doctors, university professors were all civil servants. Nothing shows this more dramatic than a photograph taken in 1930. Here is Heisenberg with his most gifted colleagues. In 1933, four of them left Germany because they were Jewish. Even Heisenberg, a non-Jew, was regarded with suspicion because physics was tarred with the brush of Einstein. Es war für ihn, glaube ich, eine schwierige Zeit. Er war sehr junger Professor. It was a very difficult time for him. He was a very young professor in Leipzig, the youngest one there. And he saw how his lectures were less and less well attended because he wasn't conformist enough. He continued to teach Einstein's physics and always mentioned Einstein's name. By 1936, all students had to attend military training. Teachers and lecturers were sent to so-called summer camps during which they were taught how they must educate the new German elite. Die Studenten mussten eine militärische Ausbildung. All students had to attend these courses, and if they didn't, they would not receive their diplomas or their certificates. Die Studenten in Leipzig, ich würde sagen, waren. I would say 90% of students in Leipzig University were in Nazi military organizations. 10% were fanatical national socialists. And all our studies and our research became more and more militaristic. 
For instance, you didn't calculate any longer the parabola of an object, but now you calculated the trajectory of a cannon. And now the guns were trained on Heisenberg. In 1937, he was accused of teaching Jewish physics, as opposed to Aryan physics. The SS Weekly, the Black Corps, attacked him as a white Jew. People like Heisenberg are all representatives of Judaism in Germany's spiritual life, who must be eliminated just as the Jews themselves. The bullies were circling, prodding and probing. The SS even spuriously accused Heisenberg of being homosexual. Himmler ordered Heisenberg to the Prinz Albrechtstraße, which at the time was the headquarter of the Nazi terror machine. And there he waited for hours, without Himmler seeing him. Himmler was in the office next door, asking all the time, is he still sitting there? Is this Heisenberg still sitting there? For hours, you have to imagine, here is the Nobel Prize winner sitting there and waiting in the Prince Albrecht Street, waiting and only wanting to hear from Himmler that the attacks on him would stop. He wasn't admitted. Heisenberg had to go back home without having achieved anything. All we know is that he was very shaken when he returned home from these interrogations. While he was waiting there to be questioned, he had heard other people being interrogated. He had heard the cries and the beating. Heisenberg snapped. He used his family connections. The family knew the Himmlers. And so, in a one-year-long negotiation, he got from Himmler a letter in which Himmler says, you will not be uh, attacked again. But on the other hand, when you teach, do not mention names that are supposed to be forbidden. Make a dissociation between the work and the people who invented it. And he stuck with that. Heisenberg had made an accommodation with the Nazis. He would go on teaching physics, but without mentioning the Jew, Einstein. When it came to speaking up for Jews, he got so worried, it was like a cat with its paws being burnt. He pulls back its old diplomacy, subtlety. He will not commit himself. And of course, he could have done, might have had a bit of a fright, but that was his nature. He was somewhat timid because he believed in the need for obedience and patriotism. Then came a discovery that meant Heisenberg could no longer hide. In Berlin, in late 1938, the scientist Otto Hahn succeeded in splitting in two the atoms of this stuff, the metal uranium, a process known as fission. Physicists around the world immediately realized that fission released an enormous amount of energy, enough perhaps to create a weapon more devastating than anything the world had ever known. This awesome new discovery dominated every conversation at a physics conference in America in the summer of 1939. The world was on the edge of war, and it would be the last time that Heisenberg could speak freely with his friends. They urged him to stay in America. They knew that if he returned to Germany, he would be asked to build an atom bomb for Hitler. You know, he talked something about physics, and then the conversation in the afternoon began to turn to more political matters. Did he really want to go back, and wasn't it better to stay in America? And he said, well, no, he couldn't do that. He made it quite clear he was a German. He belonged in Germany. And the war might be destructive, so he wanted to be there to help whatever, whatever came of it. We tried to point out that it was a bad regime and so, but it was hard to do that to a man who had already got his mind made up. 
So Heisenberg came home. But would he be able to stay true to his values of pure science? Could he be a good patriot without giving Hitler the bomb? In September 1939, as Germans tasted the excitement of war, Werner Heisenberg began work as chief scientist on the Nazi bomb. He threw himself into the project. His authority was totally unquestioned. It was a kind of honor to be given. And since he had been under scrutiny before, it was one indication that he was getting back into full graces. The decisions he was about to take would mean the difference between winning and losing the war. In 1939, this is what he and all the other scientists knew about building a bomb. A uranium atom is like a mousetrap on the verge of springing. When struck by a tiny subatomic particle called a neutron, represented here by a cork, it splits violently. As it splits, the atom fires off two of its neutrons. Those two hit two more atoms and release four neutrons. They hit four more atoms and release eight neutrons, and so on. Have enough mousetraps and you can trigger an exponential frenzy called a chain reaction, and all in a split second. But this experiment depended on a trick, the plastic cover. Without it, the first few corks would have flown off into empty space and the chain reaction would never have got going. If we hadn't had this cover, we would have needed hundreds of square feet of mousetraps. Likewise with uranium, we would need a large amount of it, a critical mass. And so far, no one had calculated how much this was. But in 1940, Heisenberg was the man with the answers. He was building a reactor to create this chain reaction. The plan was for it to become unstable and explode. The contrast between Heisenberg's urgency and the West's lethargy could not have been more acute. In vain, the great physicist Albert Einstein, now in America, tried to warn the American president how close Germany was to an atomic bomb. The reason for the American indifference was that they knew that an atom bomb would only work with a very rare form of uranium, U-235. But much less than 1% of the uranium that's dug out of the ground is U-235. And up till now, no one had managed to separate even a speck of it. Since the critical mass was thought to be in the order of tons, an atom bomb seemed in the realms of fantasy. Then came a shock. Remember this picture? Rudolf Piles was one of Heisenberg's Jewish students whom the Nazis had forced to leave Germany. Travelling to England, he'd met up with another Jewish émigré, Otto Frisch. Both had been offered temporary jobs at Birmingham University. But since Piles was an enemy alien, he wasn't allowed to work on sensitive projects like radar. Instead, he and Frisch explored the fantasy world of the atom bomb. And in 1940, in a small office in Birmingham University, Frisch and Piles made an amazing discovery that the critical mass of U-235 needed for a bomb 
was only a kilo, a fraction of any previous estimate. That Frisch says in his memoirs that when he and Pyrrhus calculated this tiny critical radius, this critical mass of less than a kilogram, they suddenly stopped and looked at each other dumbfounded at the new possibility that had just opened before their eyes. A bomb was possible after all. But if they had made this calculation, so must Heisenberg, their teacher. We assumed that because when Heisenberg was here in the summer of 39, he talked a lot about fission. So we assumed for certain that they had a project on uranium chain reaction and then on an atomic bomb. Leipzig University. Where now the rubbish is put out was where, in 1941, Heisenberg was building his reactor to produce a chain reaction. It was at this point that he made an extraordinary decision. The road to a bomb lay open before him, he said, and he was so alarmed by this prospect that he sought the advice of his colleague, Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker. Together, they decided to visit their old mentor, Niels Bohr, in Nazi-occupied Copenhagen. Bohr carried enormous influence with scientists worldwide. I already discussed it with Heisenberg, and we had the common idea that it would be good to prepare a talk between Heisenberg and Bohr on the question whether physicists all over the world might be able to agree not to make the bomb, or at least not to hurry it, uh, during the war. According to Heisenberg, that's what he said to Bohr during an evening walk in a Copenhagen park in the autumn of 1941. It is one of the most famous conversations in the history of science. A scientist risking his life, denying his country the means to win the war for moral reasons. He was afraid of this possibility to build a bomb. That he had the idea that via Bohr one can make a league of anti-bomb physicists worldwide so that the, this bomb and this discovery would never go to the bad end. The story goes on that after trying his best to convince Bohr of his good intentions and failing, Heisenberg returned home and did all he could to sabotage the German bomb. And that's how the story might have stayed, but for one crucial piece of evidence. Niels Bohr wrote a letter about what happened at that meeting. It has remained secret until now, but one man has read it. Niels Bohr has written a letter, which I have seen was shown to me by the family, and uh, which strongly disagrees with the interpretation that Heisenberg gave to that meeting later. Heisenberg tried to persuade Bohr to um, accept the German domination of Denmark, to collaborate with the German embassy, and Bohr wanted nothing of it. And Heisenberg tried to persuade Bohr to be friendly to, to the Germans. Was Heisenberg a good German, trying to prevent Nazi nuclear Armageddon? Or was he actually working for the Nazis, putting pressure on old friends? For me, it is unimaginable that my father could have lived a lie for his entire life, even amongst his most intimate friends. It is utterly ridiculous to believe that my father would have fabricated a lie about his own life. He simply wasn't like that. One man's word against another. If that's all we had to go on, then we might reasonably give the benefit of the doubt to Heisenberg. After all, we know that he didn't build a bomb. But what he did next 
seems to contradict his story of the scientist who put morality before country. Here, at the end of 1941, in a building now a theatre school, Werner Heisenberg lectured an audience of top Nazi party and military officials on the possibility of a bomb. This was followed by a detailed report. The report runs to about 130 odd pages typewritten. It's got a patent is listed for a bomb, which I take to be a, an exploding reactor bomb, not a true nuclear weapon. It would use enriched uranium-235 with a moderator, such as graphite, and somehow or other lose its stability, its thermal equilibrium, and then just explode and create a very nasty mess. Far from sabotaging his bomb, Heisenberg seemed to be surging ahead. But the battle was about to be joined. The discovery by Frisch and Piles that only a small amount of U-235 was needed to build a bomb had galvanized the Americans. A team of scientists was assembled. The biggest industrial project in the history of the world began. Ironically, its leaders were the very Jewish physicists that the Nazis had kicked out of Germany a few years earlier. The race was on. The fact that we assumed that there was a German project was the main motivation for us to, to work on the uranium reactions. It was decisive. We were afraid of a German atomic bomb. We had to have it first. Nazi Germany had now reached its zenith. There was the belief that within a year the war would be over. All that was needed was the knockout blow. That was the challenge for Albert Speer, Hitler's newly appointed armaments minister. Speer began taking a look at all the secret weapons projects, bombs, rockets, anything that looked likely to deliver the killer punch. At the beginning of 1942, he was intrigued to hear that Germany's physicists were on the track of building a weapon that will annihilate whole cities. Speyer asked to meet Heisenberg and was shown around the nuclear research facility, which used to be here in a Berlin suburb. The scientists called it the virus house to deter the curious. Dr. Engel, this is the foundation on which the virus house stood originally? Yes. Uh, A critical moment. This was the chance for Heisenberg to get from Speer all the funding he needed for his bomb. Astonishingly, he asked for just enough money to build this small underground laboratory. Loose change at a time when the Americans were spending billions. And now we are entering the reactor chamber. Yes, this is the reactor chamber. And in the middle of the room, here, was a reactor. And it was a modern laboratory for nuclear uh, experiments. I see. Here, Speer says, you know, I asked Heisenberg at dinner that night how much he, money he wanted. And he answered, a few hundred thousand Reichsmarks or whatever it happens to be. And, Speer said, you know, I was astounded at this small request. Speer now put Heisenberg on the spot. They asked Heisenberg, can you make a, an atomic bomb in nine months? And Heisenberg said, no, with the best of conscience. Nobody could it do it in nine months. For Hitler, it was the last straw. He had always had a layman's disdain for nuclear physics, regarding it as incomprehensible and a Jewish science. So when the young, pushy Werner von Braun showed the Führer film of his latest rocket, Hitler became an instant convert. The money went into the V2. The atom bomb was forgotten.
was this conclusive proof that Heisenberg, the good German, had denied Hitler the one thing that would have won Germany the war? Niemand hat die Bombe gewollt. Nobody of the people who worked on it wanted the bomb. Everybody saw that now that you could do it, someone would, because you will always find someone who's willing to do it. But why did they stop? The real story is very different. Thanks to an extraordinary piece of British intelligence, we can tell exactly why the Germans never did build a bomb. This is Farm Hall, a country house near Cambridge. In 1945, the Allies captured Germany's top nuclear scientists, including Heisenberg, and interned them here. British intelligence wanted to know what they'd been up to, what secrets they were hiding. Unbeknownst to the Germans, all their conversations were recorded by hidden microphones. And in the transcripts, we have the core of the matter. We have the scientists discussions minute by minute and day by day of what they understood to be the technical possibilities for a bomb. We have them go through again the path that they followed from 1939 onwards, why they took the decisions they did, what they understood, what they didn't understand, and how they saw their project during the war in comparison to the Allies. The most revealing section of the Farm Hall transcripts begins on August the 6th, 1945, with a British officer summoning Otto Hahn, the man who had discovered fission six years earlier, to tell him of an extraordinary announcement on the BBC. Here is the news. President Truman has announced tremendous achievements by Allied scientists. They have produced the atomic bomb. One has already been dropped on a Japanese army base. At home, it has been a bank holiday of thunderstorms as well as sunshine. The temperature at the bomb's center was greater than the sun's. The flesh on all living creatures within half a mile was seared to a bundle of black char. Their internal organs evaporated. Further away, people were torn apart by the shock wave. The skin peeled off those up to two miles away. The intense radiation continued killing for months. 140,000 people died at Hiroshima, confirming the hopes and fears of the American scientists. So how did Heisenberg, the man who allegedly had known since 1940 how to build a bomb and had refused for moral reasons, how did he respond? Heisenberg's first reaction is the most telling moment, I think, in the whole set of transcripts that we have, the whole 200 and some pages of uh, English translation and summary of what the Germans said. And Heisenberg's first reaction is that uh, it's impossible. The news story must be a mistake. Did they use the word uranium in connection with this atomic bomb? No. no. no then it's got nothing to do with atoms, but the equivalent of 20,000 tons of high explosive. All I can suggest is that some dilettante in America who knows very little about it has bluffed them in saying, if you drop this, it has the equivalent of 20,000 tons of high explosive, and in reality, it doesn't work at all. At any rate, Heisenberg, you're just second raters, and you might as well pack up. I still don't believe a word about the bomb. I consider it perfectly possible that they have about 10 tons of enriched... Uranium. For several minutes, Heisenberg rants on, refusing to believe that anyone can build an atomic bomb. Not the demeanor of a man who knows how to, but who has not deigned to. Their speculations range over an enormous variety of practical and completely impractical ideas all jumbled together. Reactors, uh, bombs with 
moderator, bombs like reactors, bombs made from protoactinium, bombs made from ionium, bombs made from thorium, bombs made with all kinds of exotic designs. They go through one after another to try and guess how the Allies can have done what they've decided can't realistically be done. Late on the night of Hiroshima, Otto Hahn, who is not a physicist himself, turns to Heisenberg and puts him on the spot. He asks him to explain how a bomb works. How does the bomb explode? In the case of the bomb, it can only be done with very fast neutrons. The fast neutrons in 235... It's at this point that the whole myth of the noble scientist crumbles. The story that Heisenberg denied Hitler the bomb only stands if he knows how to build a bomb. But the more he goes on, the more evident it becomes that he doesn't. The whole thing hinges upon the calculation of critical mass, the amount of U-235 you need to get a chain reaction going. So uh, there's a fission at the start. Each time there's a fission, you get two new neutrons, but I'm only going to draw one. It reaches another uranium nucleus. In a chain reaction, one neutron first of all splits one atom, which releases two neutrons, which split two more atoms, and so on, doubling the amount each time. Heisenberg worked out that in 80 such steps, you would split a million, billion, billion atoms in a flash and release enough energy to destroy an entire city. He then used a simple formula to work out how much uranium this would take. So here he takes the length of each step, six centimeters, and the number of steps is 80. The square root of 80 is roughly nine. So Heisenberg concludes that the critical radius to get an explosion is nine times six centimeters, which is 54 centimeters. And that corresponds to a mass of uranium of 13 tons. It's an elegant calculation. It's an appealing calculation. And though it looks delightfully clear and simple at first sight, it's conceptually completely wrong. Heisenberg's mistake was to believe that every neutron had to split an atom. In fact, it didn't matter if a lot of them missed their mark. The chain reaction would still keep going. But this simple miscalculation costs Germany the war. This is the amount of uranium that Frisch and Pyrrells in March 1940 estimated would be needed for an atomic bomb, about one kilogram, an amount they said in their report to the British government that could probably be isolated in about a year with a large but not unachievable industrial investment. This was if any one point in the project was, the moment at which a bomb began to seem a feasible, not just a theoretically possible prospect. And this is the amount of uranium that Werner Heisenberg calculated would be needed for a bomb at Farm Hall in August of 1945, presumably the estimate he carried throughout the war, 13,000 kilograms of uranium-235. At the height of production of the Allied project, at the end of World War II, the output of the isotope separation plant at Oak Ridge was perhaps several hundred grams a day, an amount that could produce a bomb like this every few days, an amount that would produce this much in about 150 years. Well, this is a crucial mistake as a first step. It made it really physically impossible for them ever to make a good case that they are really on the track of an atomic bomb project. I believe the young people there knew it. But no one's going to contradict him, he's the great professor. And you contradict a man like that at your risk, especially Heisenberg. And here we have to look at the personality. I mean, he's jovial. I mean, you talk to people who know, who've met Heisenberg, very jovial, very friendly and outgoing during his trips around the place. But you get on the wrong side, you contradict a man like that, and uh, he has a very violent temper underneath. You know, you, you beat him at table tennis and he comes out at you. 
At Farm Hall, the German physicists realized that Heisenberg had got it dreadfully wrong. It was left to Karl Friedrich von Weizsäcker to come up with a face-saving explanation for his failure. I believe the reason we didn't do it was because all the scientists didn't want to do it on principle. If we had all wanted Germany to win the war, we would have succeeded. And so the story of the moral resistance of the German physicists was born, still debated in books and plays 60 years later. There is this uh, fanciful fairy tale now that psychologically Heisenberg prevented himself from making such a calculation in order to sabotage the project, which is completely un-German. You would not want to do that. If we had had the capacity to build the bomb, we would have done so, but we didn't have it. The real question would have been, if we had had the capacity of building a bomb, would we have done it? Thank God we never had to ask ourselves this question. Never. After six months at Farm Hall, Heisenberg and the others were allowed to return to Germany. Heisenberg could never face the fact that he had simply got his sums wrong. Equally, he never made any claims for his own moral courage. I think my father was not a hero. He was not a hero. Or at least he did not see himself as a hero and he was a very self-critical person. And I think this is why he said that he had been very lucky never to have been confronted with a choice of being a hero or dying, because he wasn't at all sure that he would have behaved like a hero. That's how he felt about it, I think. I don't think the betrayal was to have worked on an atom bomb for Hitler. It was to have worked on an atom bomb for Hitler. <laughs> it's whether one should only do physics or whether one should do physics and be a human being at the same time. And that's what he should have done. Perhaps it's hard for us to let go of the idea that great scientists are morally wiser than the rest of us. But Werner Heisenberg, the good German, did not resist Hitler. It was his faulty calculations, not his moral courage, that spared us the Nazi bomb.